Great. First off, love, oh, yeah. love the oh, hat. Thank you. thank you for making me feel more comfortable with myself. <laughs> the prongs on yours are a bit flaccid. It's That's so true, it's true. Um, you might need a bit more whoopee. <laughs> All right, so All right. we've seen the pilot, and Jughead is very different from the comics that we mm -hmm. have read. So Definitely from the digest, yeah. <laughs> he's, he's definitely different from the digest. Um, he is very. He very much resembles the Jughead in the Mark Wade and Fiona Staples, a more recent reboot of the Archie comic series, in which he's this kind of outsider. He's a little more. Uh, he's not. He's down on his luck in in those comics as well, and he's uh, he gets a very objective perspective on the on the entirety of the of the workings of Riverdale. But he's still kind of on the outside. He's not, he's still, in, in the show he carries very much the same sardonic, sarcastic uh, sense of dry, he's a very cynical character, he, but he, um, he's definitely a little more down on his luck in this show, which I think explains why uh, he's quite cynical. Um, you find out, you know, in, in the pilot, which you don't see a lot of Jughead, you hear Jughead's voice, so he's the narrator of this, the, uh, the entire show, which is quite fun, so he's the perspective character, but um, you don't really know what angle he's coming from in the pilot, and slowly but surely over the season you start to see just how involved he is in it, and he definitely has his own angle that he's trying to pursue. It's not like he's, uh, I don't know, it's not like he's coming at it from some altruistic approach. He's, he definitely has his own reason for being there. I know there's a, a right to between Yeah. I'm wondering, what is that relationship? How are we going to see that relationship play out? Yeah, you know, the, the original treatment that I had read of the show, that that wasn't, that didn't happen. They, they were, you know, apparently they were quite good at the beginning, but I, I think, you know, the creative thought it would be more interesting to have either a reparation of, or, a, you know, a repairing of their relationship over time. Um, it is stated in the show that Archie and Jughead were once very close best friends, just like they were in the Digest and in the comics, and, and so that still holds quite true for the origin stories, as we would call them, but uh, we, we we thought it would be more interesting if there was a little tension and we could, we could talk about it and we could have a story to build off of that, and that would be more fun, but um, episode two is um, a a deeper exploration of why they're upset at each other, what happened, and what could happen in the future if, if they should choose to be okay and forgive and, and, and all of that. Now, Mindy was talking about how she's going to work with Jughead to yeah. combat the corruption of the police department and the adults, the Blossoms and everything like that. How would you describe this team up? Um, how would I describe the team up? Hmm. It's because Betty has the journalistic resources from her parents um, and the background of her lineage, and Jughead is an objective character on the outside, very much of their school society and of their society at large. It gives him uh, an interesting angle to approach writing about the town, writing about the students, writing about how people treat him, and you know, by association, treat the rest of their classmates and, and the citizens of this, of this Riverdale. Um, Betty, it, it's pretty obvious that Betty, uh, her relationship to the journalism of the show is very much driven by her relationship with her mother, whereas Jughead, you know, I don't, without saying too much, ha has a different angle for it. But he, uh, Jughead really approaches a lot of this, you know, a lot, a, a lot of his motivation, in my opinion, is driven by him trying to figure out quite a bit about himself. Um, and how he stands in society, and where he fits in, and how people are treating him. Um, it's like when when you, it's like you know, it's the classic. If you're a bully in school, it's probably because you know the person is hurting a bit at home. You know, you're trying to figure out. Jughead is trying to figure out other people, or he's being quite cynical to other people, or he's, he's pushing away from other people because he doesn't understand himself. And I think a lot of that writing is going on through that. Do you have a favorite Jughead episode so far of the ones you shot? This one, actually, is the one we're shooting right now, which is also explains why I have very little time, unfortunately, <laughs> because we're, it's, a jug, it's a pretty Jughead-heavy episode, and you find out quite a bit about his origin, and, or, well, the origin. Um, that's, yeah, well, this. Nice. 
you talk mm -hmm. about struggling with yourself sure. in the comics. Mm -hmm. Um, most recently, Jughead was kind of identified as asexual. Yeah, I'm uh, glad you brought it up. Is that something that you're going to explore on the show? Well, it's first off, I don't think it's. I I personally would love to see that mm -hmm. exploration, but I'm just the actor. Uh, at the end of the day, to to say that that's my job or my duty is probably a misunderstanding of the writer's role and the director's role and the producer's role. Like, I, if, if I was in full creative charge of this character, it would, you know, things obviously would be different. Things obviously would go a certain way, but it seems to me that they're not going to explore that angle. Um, and I think because, I, and that's, to me, that's kind of unfortunate, to be quite honest. Uh, I think there's a lot of room for growth in that, and I think that kind of representation is quite interesting, and I think it's needed, mm -hmm. uh, frankly. But this is also one of those things where it's only really been canon in a single mm -hmm. iteration of the Archie universe, and that's the Darsky's universe. That's mm -hmm. it, it was said very shortly in passing, and it really wasn't addressed with kind of the fullness that I think it should have been addressed with. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, you know, it has garnered... <laughs> You know, unfortunately for the other representations of Jughead, it has garnered much of the attention on his character. Mm -hmm. You know, this is, Jughead has not really been asexual until that single iteration of, of Zdarsky's comic about a year, maybe, a year ago? Year, yeah. So it's not in the digest, it's not in any of the previous ones, and now it's become kind of the linchpin of his character, mm -hmm. um, which I also don't know if that's right specifically. Uh, but I, I don't have that kind of control as an actor, um, to be quite honest. I, I would love to sit here and be like, yes, of course, <laughs> he will do this and this. But, you know, we'll see. I know that, you know, I, I, I know that Jughead's story right now has not fully been explored, and especially in terms of sexuality and his placement with, with the world. And I think because he as a character is so, so lost, uh, just amongst himself and amongst his, his relations with everyone around him that I, I don't, I think there's a lot of growth available there and, and there's a lot of narrative that can be explored. But I really think if you want the answer to this question, you should point it at some of the creative leads on this show because I think that would be a little more poignant and you guys would be able to get better answers. Well, Roberto is also behind the afterlife with RG Comics and, you know, there was talk about the Halloween special yeah. and zombies and... Just if they could figure out a way to do that, is that something you'd be into? Would the you... afterlife stuff? Yeah. I, I mean, I would love it. I, you know, I, I love it as long as it doesn't break the theme and mood of the show. You know, and that, that to me has kind of been the balance we, we've had, you know, because Jughead is like the, the narrator, which is a super kind of film noir angle, but he's also kind of the comic relief. And the balance that the writers and a lot of the creative have been finding with the tone of this show is a balance between where comedy is appropriate and where we have to keep the, the moodiness and the tone and, and all of that. So if we can manage to find a way to you know, inject the afterlife with RG into the show in a way that's not you know, heavy handed or, or done in, in a shoddy way, I think then, hell yeah, I'd love to see that stuff. That's awesome. I mean, I personally would love to be able to be a zombie because I know Jughead is the zombie in Afterlife with Archie. So yeah, I'd love to see all of that stuff. We know the show is cast in Ethel. Have you gotten to work together at any point yet? Um, well, I've spent some time with her on set, but they're definitely going to be exploring that angle between Jughead and Ethel. Um, I know that they, they really want to explore that, uh, but no, I actually haven't got to work with her yet, so we'll see. Well, we actually get a little bit of backstory uh, with the hat, which was covered in the comics. Mm -hmm. Will we be seeing that on screen? Um, it hasn't been covered just yet. You know, the writers like to keep us in the dark very much of this. Um, yeah, they, you know, and then when we ask for the scripts and we ask for creative, they go, well, maybe. <laughs> that keeps the dynamic really strong and tense. Uh, but no, I, I don't know. Um, we haven't explored it yet, but I'm sure they'll explore it. In the same way that we explore the Ash shirt for Jughead and we explore some of the more iconic you know, trademarks of, our, of all the existing characters, we're definitely going to explore the hat as well. Is he a reliable narrator? Is he? Uh, I don't think Jughead's a reliable anything, to be honest. Um, no, I think he is. Yeah, I think he is. For certain. 
I was going to say, in an episode like this where you are significantly more on screen, are we seeing less of the off-screen narration, or it, does the narration seem to be a steady amount no matter how much you're in an hour? Um, the narration really takes place at the beginning and the end of every show. Um, and so we're bookending each episode. Uh, and no, even in, the, in, even in the Jughead heavy episodes, we still see that narration. And what has it been like narrating the show? What has that process been like? It's fun, but you know when you, uh, you, you record your own voicemail and then you listen back to it and you're like, God, <laughs> that sounds so nasally. I, you know, I, I never, uh, when I was younger, I never thought myself to be qualified for like a Morgan Freeman kind of narration or like a planet Earth, but I've watched my film noirs. I'm, I'm getting into it, you know, I'm trying to, I, it's funny when I originally read for Jughead, um, they had his introductory monologue for the, for the audition and I was in a weird place so I just spent like a week watching the old Twilight Zones and uh, of course Rod Serling, I, I channeled that in the audition and Roberto was perfect, you know, so I, I bring a lot of that in, you know, I, I, I'm trying to do a little more of that and I'm, I'm definitely drinking a lot of water and clearing my throat a lot. Um, it's disgusting. If you heard me in the booth, you'd be like, ugh. <laughs> but it's, uh, I think it's turning out well so far. Well, we visited Pop's Diner. Great oh, set. I love <laughs> that set. Is, it, um, is that going to continue to be Jughead sort of Haunt. HQ or what's, what's um, I think so. Yeah, I think so. Uh, you know, in a lot, of the, a lot of the establishing shots for each episode, you know, of Jughead writing still take place at Pop's. But Pop's has, you know, Pop's is not just Jughead's haunt. Pops has really become, you know, the the main set in terms of, you know, our, when we return. It's it's a comfortable place and it's well lit. And in contrast to some of the darker tones and the darker sets that we have on this, to have this well lit, familiar diner location is a nice way to bring the audience back to like a, a more comfortable palate cleanser of, of the tone. And I think that's what we're using Pops as. Mm -hmm certainly feels like another character. It does. And I, I mean, I love, that's certainly my favorite set. I love, we actually, we had a, uh, uh, a big rig pull into the diner recently thinking it was an active diner. <laughs> and we had to turn them around. It, it, we actually, we, it's built as a fully functioning diner. So I'm trying to convince everybody to, like, hey, when we're off season, you know, just turn it around. <laughs> turn it around, make a little cash with it. Who knows? But no, it's, I love that set. It's my favorite. Do we get to see any of Jughead's home life or his dog or anything oh, like that? Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, in terms of hot dog, I'm not gonna say too much, but yeah. What's the, uh, the relationship like with Reggie Mantle? Because uh, somebody earlier mentioned that that's uh, an interesting one. Reggie Mantle, so Reggie Mantle right now has been a kind of complicated character to pursue. Uh, in, in my opinion. He is played by basically our favorite guy, Ross Butler, but Ross is uh, a talented working actor on another show. Um, so without, we don't want to sacrifice him playing that character and it's kind of been a juggle between when he's available to come onto the set to play Reggie and when he's not. Um, he's still very much the, he, an antagonizing character. He's, he's wealthy and, and large and imposing, and um, he certainly doesn't like Jughead um, because Jughead is quick-witted and that has never really been Reggie's strong suit. Um, so we, we play that a little bit. As of now, he's not really been a primary antagonist, so he's, he's because it, uh, Reggie, from what I've read of the digest and, uh, and of the comics, Reggie's not a hated character. He's, uh, he's like well, that really annoying friend that you all have that you're like, uh, you're kind of a fuckboy sometimes, but I guess uh, you're cool, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, uh, so he's, he, we, it's, it's, I, I can imagine writing him to be quite complicated because you, you, the audience should still love and feel nostalgic about Reggie being there while not simultaneously hating him. Um, so I, I, I know that Ross is going to eventually be, uh, um, he's going to wrap the season of the other project that he's working on, and that's going to free him up for some more time on this show, which I think is going to be nice. 
Other than oh, Jeff Ed, is sure. there a character whose progression you've been really excited to see over the course of the season, like just as a, a fan of the other characters of the show? Mm -hmm. um, for me, I, I really like Archie's character. I really do. I, I, I think because in a more realistic and modern sense, an absolutely girl-crazy <laughs> young man it is kind of a deviant thing. And to see it take a, mo a more realistic tone is, is interesting, and I, I like that as, a, as, a, as an exploration of his character. So I'm interested to see where that goes. And if, you know, it's already in the show, it's already gotten him into trouble, not fake trouble, legitimate trouble. And I think, you know, th as a narrative, I think that's, that's interesting to me. You know, and, uh, a character that's so blinded by his pursuit of, of you know, women and the accidents that he gets into with that, like it was in the comics and the digest, I think that's an interesting narrative. So I like Archie's character, I really do.